Isn't he amazing? Don't let, don't let the word, once again, one of those words that, that gets overused. And we have so many things that are amazing or so we say in our world. And I would really like to ask, really? How many things are really amazing? Yeah, I know you were amazed when that guy threw it behind his back, turned 360 and dunked. We were wow, that was amazing. Really? Although it was fantastic and we couldn't believe what was done, one sister said to me once, I can't use that word anywhere else but with God. I remember her saying, only God is amazing. And I agree. I said, sis, I, I, I hear that. Only God is amazing. Good morning. Glad that we are here to jump into God's word. I'm grateful for our worship. And um, just continue to pray for us as a fellowship as we continue to grow, change, as we continue to see God work among us. We're going to continue in Philippians. You do have an outline there that will have some more details in it, but the big bullet points will be up on our screen this morning as we continue on with chapter one. <clears throat> and we'll be looking at this morning, as I said, to my joy over partnerships and really wanted to be more specific. And it says joy over gospel-centered partnerships. In the book of Philippians, we hear Paul's joyful heart and we hear his contented life. And, and, and we're going to see why he was able to do that. Remember where he was writing this from. He wasn't writing this from the comfort of his living room. He wasn't writing this from the confines of a nice office. He wasn't writing this from on vacation in Cancun or wherever that was back at that time. He wasn't writing from comfort. He was writing from prison being incarcerated for his faith. And yet he writes this warm, what has been noted as a friendship letter to the Philippians, thanking them for their concern for him and how, he, how they demonstrated it and letting them know that the one who sent the gift was all right, Epaphroditus, because he had gotten sick. And so he was writing them to calm their hearts and let them know really where real joy comes from. I love that he didn't write it from someplace comfortable. Why didn't, uh, why? I like that. He didn't write it from someplace comfortable. Because if he did, we would have said, well, he doesn't know what my hard situation is like. He doesn't know what it's like to go through hard times. Sometimes God will have us bless people from some of the most unlikely places and, from, and sometimes from some of the most hard places so that his glory can be seen. Stand with me, please. We're going to pray. We've read the scripture through the responsive reading. I'm not going to read it all in its entirety again, but let's just go before the Lord. Father, thank you so much that you have allowed us to gather this morning again under your banner. You alone are great, Lord. You alone are are amazing. Father, I pray that as we open your word, that you would open our hearts and minds. Father, that you would help us to see the critical nature of seeing who you are, learning of what you're saying, and then looking to obediently live it. I pray, God, that all the distractions that are there or the potential for distraction, Lord, we would lay aside and we would focus in on you. I pray you would soften our hearts and our minds and that we would be willing to listen and hear. And then after that, that we would be willing to obey. Strengthen us, Lord, now in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. They said we read it during responsive reading, a joy over gospel-centered partnerships. The gospel of Jesus Christ brings joy to both the person who was changed by it, and those who partnered together to spread it. And I'm going to ask a question in the beginning. I want you to be asking yourself all throughout our time in the world, how are you choosing to be joyful over the work God has done and is doing through his gospel? 
We know that that, that word gospel, that, 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 that word speaks of the good news. And I know many times we hear it a lot too. And boy, it doesn't ring in our ears as it should, I believe. Good news. Is it good to you? Have you seen, have you tasted of its goodness for you? Can you say, not out of what you've heard someone else say, can you say because you've experienced yourself that this is good news? See, everyone likes to get good news. When you're going for that job interview and that you really wanted, you wanted to hear the good news of saying you got the job. And when you were going for that house that you always wanted and you got the news that they accepted what you want, good news. When you were in that relationship and that guy or that girl said yes, because you wanted to spend your life with them, good news, yes. When that child was born and you as family heard of the news, it was good news. Everyone likes good news. And yet I would dare say that sometimes we have grown cold to the point where we don't think this thing about Christ coming in the form, God coming in the form of man, God living his life in a, in a body, and then choosing to go to the cross after he demonstrated how to live to, for us. Then he went to the cross, died, like we all will, but rose like only those who trust him can. And that brings about the good news. I was talking with someone the other day, and we talked about the resurrection is the key to all of the Christian faith. If the resurrection did not happen, this is all a sham and a farce. It is. We're wasting our time. If all Jesus was was a good man who came and gave us some good words to live by and died a death that he shouldn't have, but standing up for the rights of the oppressed and those that were being pushed down, it's all a waste of time. We've had people that have done, you said, is that a waste? No, it helps us in this life. But then after this life is over, we are all doomed and destined to an eternity that no one wants. But what happened was Christ came and changed all that. See, Jesus changed and changes everything. And he stepped in and he interrupted the cycle and he interrupted the path that we were on. As a matter of fact, he paved a new path that only those who would trust him could actually walk and end up in fellowship with God along the way and then their destination be eternal fellowship with God. Good news. And so I'm not just waiting to get to heaven. The good news is that I get to walk with God now. I get to experience what it means to be free from sin now. I experience what it means to be able to live with purpose and with passion and with purity now. I don't have to wait. There's no pie in the sky by and by. One day we'll see you. Yeah, one day we'll see him face to face, but now I get to fellowship with him daily. Good news. Has it been good news to you? Or is it just that message that we heard when we first started coming to church? It really was that, you know, we heard about Jesus. And for many, I think it's good information. I don't know if it's good news for some of us. And so today he says, boy, part of that life of joy is the fact that we have been given the opportunity to come into life with Christ. And then he puts us in partnership with other people that have life in Christ. And so how are we going to experience that life of joy? One way and first way that Paul digs into it is joy over gospel-centered partnership. And there are two things I want to focus on this morning and we're able to look at. One is this issue of an intentional choice 
that Paul had made that led to this joy that he had for the people that he served with, and that intentional choice led to a genuine desire he had for those people. And I want to charge us today that if we are intentional in our choices about how we view those that God has put us in, put us in partnership with, that it can translate into a genuine desire that he wants all of us to have for each other as we partnership together. I mean, sorry, as we partner together or, or as we are in partnership together. First thing, an intentional choice. And what there are three things I want us to look at. The first one is choosing to be a thankful and, and choosing to be thankful and prayerful for our gospel partners. Let's look at verse three. I, I like how Paul said, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for all of you, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Look at the number of times that he uses in here, all, always, every. When he's saying that, that there is never a time when I have come to remember and think about you, people of Philippi, that I have not chosen to thank God. Actually, what that word means when he says to thank God, I know we mean sometimes we go, oh, thank the Lord. Thank you, God. Actually, what that means is that you recognize that God's grace does well. That's what that thank God means. He says, he says, I recognize God's grace in your life, and I'm choosing to be thankful and to agree with God that his grace is good. It's a choice. See, because you can see a lot of things when you look out at people, when you look out at me, when you look out at others, you can choose to see a lot of things. You can choose to say a lot of things. I like what Paul is saying. He says, in essence, I am choosing. I thank my God every time I remember you. Wow. When some of the folk that you journey with from here or out there come to your mind, boy, what are some of the thoughts that come to your mind? Sometimes we have to choose how we're going to think about people. Because what comes to our mind, we probably shouldn't be thinking about people. Paul is very intentional here. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Boy, for some of us, we go, I put my head in my hand every time I think of you. Now, my stomach turns every time I think of you. Or, I don't want to think of you. <laughs> and so, he really gives us a great model to follow. When you think about those who God has put you in partnership with. Now, notice I said, those are the believers that you are journeying with. Remember, these Philippians were journeying with Paul by their gift that they gave him, by their prayers, by their standing with him. And so, they were in partnership and so this whole deal, I mentioned this last week, why are you here? Are you here because God placed you in partnership with other believers so that you can see his purposes and his plans move forward? Or are you here because your buddy came here? Oh, this is kind of a cool place, you know? And I, hey, they, 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 they do it kind of good here. It's a nice place to be. See, God calls us together as partners. And that, and that term partnership, Paul is really using almost like a business term. You have chosen to come together for the purpose of a mission. What is that mission? Glad you asked. That mission is to see more people hear the good news and to see them grow in their faith as a result of it. And so that changes my whole mindset about why I'm with you here. And so if the chair colors bother me, it don't make a difference. Nice to sit in, but I'm not here for the chairs. The paint that you chose to put on the wall, I'd probably paint it differently maybe, you know. That's what you may say. I may paint it differently. I wouldn't use that, but I'm not here for the paint. The worship could have been a little tighter this morning. I'm not saying that for me. I'm just saying that's what some people would say. I love the worship. Well. <laughs> Y'all probably saying, what? Wow, he's bold. No, the worship was wonderful. But someone might say, wow, worship wasn't as tight this morning. You know what? 
I'm grateful for the worship, but why am I here? I'm here for the partnership. God put me in partnership with you. Don't tell me everything you like about your job is what keeps you there. I love everything about it. That's why I'm here. No, you love the fact that they allowed you to be in partnership. And, and one of the results of that partnership is that they hand you a paycheck ever so often. You love it, the partnership. You don't like everything that goes on in that organization, but you love the partnership. And God puts us together and says, here's why you walk together. Now walk together. Boy, and then it becomes less about me, and it becomes more about him and his mission. And as we keep that in mind, those times when people get us upset, where we say, God, I'm here for the partnership, but help me, boy, one of your partners, Lord. <laughs> and God says, they're your partner. And you go, God, but they were your partner first. I know. So I love them as you love me. Partnership. Choosing to be confident. So not only are we choosing to be thankful and prayerful for our gospel partners. He says, every time I remember you, I'm thankful. The next one is choosing to be confident of God's work in our gospel partners. Where do I find that? You see verse 6, and he says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Now remember, back in that first one when he was choosing to be thankful, he was thankful that indeed that they became partners, but now he is thankful for the fact that they're going to stay partners. And he says he was excited from the first day until now, and then he says until the day of Christ. He says, I was grateful on the day that you came into partnership with Jesus Christ, you got saved, and thus he put us into partnership with one another, and now I'm grateful that we're still partners but I'm grateful that I know that God will keep us and so that we can remain partners until Christ comes. Now, even if you're not in the same location any longer, because remember, Paul is not in Philippi writing this. He had already left. He had, he, he'd gone. But he says, we're still partners. We may not be sitting together, but our hearts are joined together. God may have some go to somewhere else, and continue the partnership as they bring others in, but we're still partners. See, the deal becomes when we start seeing this whole thing as being about Christ, about being about God and his mission, boy, it causes our hearts. It, it, it reshapes our thinking and our hearts and our minds about how I live with you and how you live with me. And he says, I am confident of this. He is choosing to be confident. Why? Because he realizes the one who is at work is worthy of his trust. See, he says being confident, actually what that literally means is I am persuaded or I have allowed myself to be persuaded because of what I've been given. God is the one who gave the assurance and thus you say, okay, God, I take that assurance I trust it. I'm confident in it. And so I'm not confident that we'll stay together because you can keep it together and you got it going on. No. And I hope you're not confident because, well, you know, that pastor dude, you know, he's really got it together. No. I'm confident because God brought us together. And I'm choosing to believe that he can keep us together. And when I do that, once again, it's not about you. And so when I get upset at something you do, my partnership wasn't because of you. I have to remember that when I fall into disagreement with other believers, the partnership was never because of you. The partnership was because of him. And until he moves me somewhere else, I'm here living out what he desires. I'm here living out what he desires. And boy, as we catch that, 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 
that, that takes so much stress off of our plates. It takes so much anxiety out of the way because God, when you say move, I can tell you there are some times when I was in our church in Germany and I would sit down in my office and I would ask because of some of the things that was happening, Lord, why am I here? I would say, you know I could be back in the U.S. and would be just fine right about now. Why am I here? And of course the answer is because I want you here. Are you still going to stay? And I'm like, you know I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just upset. <laughs> Running my mouth. Talking. And he's just like, I'm growing you up. I'm maturing you. I'm joining you closer together with others. Learn. I remember when God told me, learn to enjoy where you are. My mind was somewhere else one day. I remember that. I was thinking about all of the could be's. You know those things, right? You think about all the could be's, all the things that could be if I was doing something else. And boy, this thought just came like, I mean, almost like a bat. It didn't hurt, but it was just like a, like a wake-up call, like a, like a wiffle ball bat that way, not a wood one. So nothing... <laughs> Knock me out. It was just like, wake up. It was like, learn to enjoy and love where you are and the people that are there with you, Curtis. And I just got, I was sitting in my office and I was like, whoa. I had to ask God to forgive me because I was not, I was not enjoying it. But it was a choice. And so he said he was choosing to be persuaded. Some of us, boy, nothing can persuade us. People can show you something that'll blow your mind and you sit there unimpressed. Like, whatever, saw that already. They could do something that was new to mankind and you'd be... Because you refuse to be persuaded. And some of us say, I didn't get enough evidence. No, you got all the evidence you needed. Some people out there, is like that, they're like that with the faith. I just need some more from Jesus to believe that he's real. You don't need anything else. He gave you everything you need. You just refuse to be persuaded. And here you see Paul choosing to be persuaded. I love how he does this. Choosing to be confident of God's work in his partners. Choosing to have affections for our gospel partners. I love this in that. See, sometimes we can choose to be thankful and prayerful. And we can choose to be confident in the work of God, but I ain't got to love him, Lord. I'll be here. I don't say I have to like it. And that's our attitude. And Paul is saying, when he talks about it, he looks at them and he says, it is right, verse 7, for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace. He says, you, I hold you in my heart. And then down in verse 8, he says, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ. He said, God knows when he looks at my heart, he sees my love I have for you, not because of something in you that necessarily draws me to you, like maybe it's, you know, hair color, clothes, um, walk of life, economic status, ethnicity, nothing. He says, the affection I have came from my connection with Christ. So I love you because I love Christ. And he says, and I love you with the affection that Christ gives when you come into relationship with him. Why is it that we claim to love God and can't stand being around one another? I had, a, I had a pastor say this once, and, and I, I, I was trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. I said, I understand what you are trying to say. And then I said, no, I don't even understand what you're trying to say. <laughs> no, I understand what you're trying to say. Made this comment. <clears throat> he said, I love being around sinners more than I love being around the people of God. Wow. I, said, I want to put that in everyday life. You love being around your neighbor more than you like being around your family? Do you like being around the people from the house down the street than you do around the people that you live in your house with? 
if you do, there's some serious dysfunction happening. Because you should, you, you should want to be around your family more than you want to be around strangers. And first I was like, okay, I understand. He, he, he's trying to say some believers just really get under his skin and some people who may pretend to be believers really aren't. No, but I was like, no, 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 no. I love being around believers more than anyone else. Now, it is needful for me to be around unbelievers, and I love being around them because I want them to come to know Christ. And being around some of them, some people are just funny and cool. And they're just great to be around, whether they're unbelievers or not. You have some of those in your life. But I love being around the family of God more than any other group of people. He said, but, but, but they get on your nerves. So do the ungodly. Oh, come on. Let's not play games. Sometimes we give them more grace than we do the people in our family. And we do that in real life as well. Sometimes we give the people out on the street more grace and forgiveness than we do our own physical family members. And God said it shouldn't be. And so Paul was choosing to be affectionate. He said, I hold you in my heart. God knows. God is my witness of how I feel about you. And he was just telling them, guys, you are my friends. You are my partners because God placed us together. Let's not get it twisted. There's nothing about so much you that is causing me to want to stay around you, even though some people have more character traits and personality traits that we like more than others. Some people are easier to be around than others. We know that. But the affection that we have should not come from what the people do for us. The affection that we have should come from what Christ did in us. And thus, I can have it for you. Choosing to have affection for our gospel partners. Question for you on your sheet. Since you have tasted of God's grace personally, what choices have you made concerning those with whom God wants, um, with whom God wants you to partner? It's a question for you to answer later. And then the next one is, how are those choices drawing you closer to those partners or how are they pulling you apart from them? The choices that you've made or are making, what are they causing you to do? Are they bringing you closer to the partners that God has you with, other believers and your partners, or, are, or is it pulling you apart? What are your choices causing to happen? And then that second part as we come down to our close is a genuine desire. My choices, my intentional choices will bring about a genuine desire. Not a fake one. I'm not trying to pretend. I'm not putting on a show. He said, this is true. And after all of that, he says in verse 9, and it is my prayer. Remember, he said he always prays for them when he thinks about them. Here's what he's praying about. He says that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He has a genuine desire for them now as partners in the gospel. And I would dare say this is what God wants us to have as we live and deal with one another. Here is the genuine desire. First one, that I would seek the growth um, of those partners, that they would grow in love and that they would grow in maturity. That I genuinely want you to, because I've chosen to see, because I've chosen to be thankful, I've chosen to see the work of God in your life, and I've chosen to be affectionate for you because of what Christ has done in me, I have a genuine desire for you, genuine desire to grow in both your love and to grow in your maturity in Christ. That's what I want. And so as I live with you, I don't get tired of people fast. I can't. Because if I have a genuine desire for you, I want you to grow. You can't get tired of me that quickly because you want me to grow. You don't give up on me that quickly because you want me to grow. 
You want my love to increase. And really, what he means by that, when he says that that, that that love is increasing, it is going beyond what is expected. I want your love and the expressions of that love, the way you express it, to just keep growing, that it finds new ways of expression. For some of us, we are like, that's it, I'm done. Not loving that dude anymore. Finished. Now, what does it mean to love? We get that mixed up because Hollywood has done a great job, too good, at redefining it. It has nothing to do with the warm fuzzies. They may come as a result of what you choose to do, but that choice for love is you are looking out for the benevolent well-being of another. You want what's right, even if what's right may hurt. You think about the surgeon that has to do surgery. I remember I had it. I had to have the thyroid removed years ago. And if the surgeon was my friend, he would say, I didn't know him personally, but if the surgeon was my friend, he would have said to me, I have to cut you, but I'm not trying to harm you. I have to cut you, but I'm not trying to harm you because I need to remove something that's bad in you. And so for us as believers, hey, man, I'm looking at your life, and boy, I, you're really going down the path that's going to destroy you, man. I may have to hurt. It doesn't mean hurt like you put them down. or you. No, I may have to do something that may hurt your feelings, but know that I'm not trying to harm you. I want you healed. Why? Because I have a genuine desire that you would grow and that you would mature. That is how God wants us to live around each other. That that desire is so, so genuine that I'm willing to do whatever it takes so that you grow. But what do I want you to grow in? I want you to grow in knowledge. But what do I mean by knowledge? He doesn't want you to grow in information. Make no mistake, he's not, you don't need more information. When he talks about knowledge, he is talking about that which you experience. Once you see and understand the truth of God, it translates into how you live it in your life. And then when he says with all depth of insight, he compares what you have learned experientially and in truth from the Word of God, you now have discernment about how to put it into play in your life. So knowledge and wisdom go together. And so as you're reading that word, as you're looking at it, now I want to see how on earth does it play out in your life. I want to see how it plays out. And so I'm seeking God to say, how does this word play out for her, for him? What do I need to do, Lord? How do I need to help them? Because he says, what he wants to happen is that they would be pure, blameless, and righteous. Wow. When was the last time in your prayer? I had to ask myself this. When was the last time in our prayer when I pray for someone, I pray for their purity, I pray for them to live a spotless life, and I pray for them to experience the fruit of living righteously. Them were some powerful prayers. God, I pray that you would keep them pure, that sin doesn't take over and have dominance in their life. Lord, I pray that you would help them to see that sin is a stain, that like grape juice on a white clothing is hard to come out, and it can stain the life in a way that they don't want it. And so I want them blameless. Oh, I know they won't be, but I'm working that they may be, and even if they do, I help them to get it right quickly. I don't throw them under the bus and back up again over them. And then lastly, he says, the fruit of righteousness. He said, I want the fact that as you live righteously, you would experience the fruit of choosing righteousness over unrighteousness. That you would choose to live right and you will see what kind of fruit you get. Paul is wanting the best for them. Man, and you see the love. You see the relationship that he has. And here are my questions for you as we get ready to close now. How 
has your intentional choices led to a genuine desire for holy living of your gospel partners? I, I'm now, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about now the other person sitting next to you. How has your prayers turned into action on behalf of your gospel partners? And we're not just praying. What are you doing after you pray? to help affect change in the people God has called you to be partners with. And then lastly, how are you allowing God's grace to work in and through you towards your gospel partners? We talk about looking at the grace that God has in them. How is the grace that God is allowing to work in you helping them? Boy, I look at this and I say joyful, over gospel-centered partnerships. I could see why Paul was joyful because his focus was on Christ. His focus was on them growing because of Christ. Them growing because of Christ. He said, I'm here because of him. I'm with you because of him. I'm staying because of him. I love you because of him. And I care about you because of him. And so here's the thing, who never changes? He never does. And so if he never changes, then I don't have to. My love for you can stay consistent. Joyful over gospel-centered partnerships. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to come into fellowship and into your family come into fellowship with you, and to come into your family. Thank you that you called us out of darkness and that we would be partners. You said co-heirs with Christ. Father, I thank you that you have given us everything we need for life and for godliness or for godly living. And I pray that we would want that for our brothers and sisters in the faith. Lord, you've called us into partnership. We're on a mission together. Help us to see what that is and live by it. Father, help our passion to be for you so that it would overcome every obstacle that is between me and my brother or sister. God, you are amazing. What you're doing in us is amazing. And what you want to do for the world is just awesome. Help us, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.